Amen. Thanks, Mike, leading us in our prayers. Thank you, Sarah, for leading us uh, so far in the service. Uh, I feel I need to justify myself really about saying I not, don't make uh, New Year resolutions. Uh, the thing is, it's difficult to make resolutions when you already live a, a perfect life. Uh, perhaps, perhaps I need uh, to res resolve to be a bit more humble. What do you think? Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure. Anyway, on to uh, more important things and uh, our passage of scripture today. It's 1 Peter, first letter of Peter, chapter 1 and verses 1 to 12. And over this next quarter, we'll be using uh, this, this letter to uh, provide confidence in difficult times. And today, these first 12 verses um, uh, uh, titled Confidence in the Gospel. Uh, if you've got a Bible, be good if, if you turn to it. I'm not going to read it all now. We're going to read it as we go. So just to refer to it as we go along would be really helpful, I think. I, I feel like I've started every sermon in the last nine months in much the same way, really. Uh, a recognition that the pandemic has created circumstances in our lives which are far from normal and for some are really difficult. And then we've opened up a passage of scripture and uh, with the intention, of course, of bringing encouragement and strength and inspiration into, into your lives, into, into my life. And guess what? We're going to do the same again. Because it seems we've been going around in a bit of a cycle, haven't we? Uh, we come to the end of one chapter of, of restrictions or one tier of restrictions with the hope that things are going to change only for that hope to be dashed and another chapter of restrictions to, to begin. You know, what might have seemed a novelty at first has become a bit of a drudgery, hasn't it, for, for most of us. We're not able to meet fully with family and friends. Uh, some simple pleasures are, are denied us. And even the necessities of, for instance, shopping are fraught, aren't they, with rules and caution. And of course, not being able to worship and fellowship together is a big miss in all of our lives well certainly in mine well look peter is writing to to us well actually he's writing verse one to god's elect strangers in the world scattered throughout warwick and lemmington and whitnash and coventry and frankton and other surrounding towns and villages and who verse six have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials now, the trials of these first century Christians probably refer into persecution under the Roman Emperor Nero. Nero was fond of blaming Christians for everything that goes wrong, uh, including the things that he uh, was responsible for. And then, of course, he enjoyed sport, didn't he, with Christians? Human torches uh, recorded, uh, lion food recorded. So they probably had it tougher, to be fair. And yet, these verses are still relevant to us. Here we are scattered and with grief and trials. Hands up. So what has Peter got to say to us? Well, he first reminds us of who we are in the Lord, and then he tells us what we have in the Lord. You see, we're talking here about the gospel, and by the gospel, I don't just mean the bit about being a sinner and needing to be saved and then being saved. We're talking here about the good news about Jesus in all its entirety and the difference that knowing him and being in relation to, with him, relationship with him, makes to our lives, uh, which takes us above and beyond whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. Our title is Confident in the Gospel. Now, there's loads in these next 20 minutes or so, so buckle up because it's quite a ride. Firstly, he tells us how, how we're chosen by God. He says, to God's elect, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. Wow. Uh, we could park the bus here, couldn't we, in these two verses all morning. But we won't. Theologians call this the doctrine of election. And simply put, we just need to know, you need to know that God has chosen you to be his. 
Sarah read it earlier, and I, you know, I'm referring to it here. We didn't collude. So, but Paul to the Ephesians wrote, were chosen in Christ before the creation of the world, were predestined to be adopted as his sons and daughters. But, but you might be thinking, well, hang on a minute. I, I chose to become a Christian. It was my decision to follow Jesus. But surely that's the doctrine of, of free will. So which is it? Was I chosen or did I choose? And the answer is both. As I say, we could spend hours here and maybe on another day we will. But just imagine, just imagine the simple illustration. You're invited to a wedding. The invitation comes weeks before. And when you check your diary, you realise that you've got a clash. Everton are in the cup final. Unlikely, I, I know. Well, but what do you do? You hum and you haw, you flip and you flop, and the day comes and you still really haven't decided what you're going to do. But at the last minute, and because it's your daughter get married, you, you make your decision and you rock up to the wedding. And what do you know? There's a place laid for you at the table. It's got your name on it. They knew you'd come. So yes, you decided to follow Jesus and God knew you would. He'd chosen you. To be elect is to be hand-picked. You're wanted by the captain to play on his team. We're talking real privilege here and that's your privilege to be chosen by him. Just, just, just dwell on that for a moment. And notice all three persons of the Godhead are involved here. The foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. That's the process of making you holy moment by moment and day by day so that none of us will need to make New Year resolutions one day. And why? For obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. I guess this might be in a different order to what we're used to. We normally would start with Christ's sacrifice, the sprinkling of his blood, and then our commitment to Christ, because in his sprinkling of his blood, he provided a way for us to be forgiven and so on. And then the sanctifying work of the Spirit in our lives. But, you know, when we're dealing with the Trinity, who live beyond time and have chosen us before the creation of the world, really the order is irrelevant it's it's this is all of god for each of us in all of life it's amazing and no wonder peter can say grace and peace be yours in abundance well it feels an, an inadequate exposition but that's the first point who are we in the lord we're chosen and listen if you go home with nothing else today just bear that in mind in these difficult times be confident in this you're chosen of the lord but but peter's only just begun it, it, it leads into this next paragraph and no wonder he begins as he does verse three praise be to the god and father of our lord jesus christ in his great mercy he has given us and he begins this deluge of benefits which are ours in Christ. Are you ready? Remember, these are given to encourage us. We can have confidence in these things. We have firstly, verse 3, a new birth. We're born again. We're born from above. We're saved. We're rescued from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of his dear son. We're taken from darkness into light, from death into life. We change from being objects of wrath to being subjects of the kingdom. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. That There are so many ways in scripture aren't there, to describe the moment when you gave your heart to the Lord and decided to follow him. It's a moment of transformation. We're ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven, new start, clean sheet. We might still be in the world, but we're no longer of it. A new birth. And it's a new birth into, verse 3, a living hope. Sarah's talked about hopes, and I'm sure you've written some, some down. And maybe one or two of you have mentioned uh, the vaccine in that hope because the vaccine has brought hope to us hasn't it in this pandemic although the hope isn't shining too brightly for for all of us uh, just yet the first four games of the football season brought bright hope to my heart as, as everton were flying sadly the bubble of hope 
in that regard has burst somewhat. The wheels have come off, come off of I mix my metaphors. And so much of the hope we have in this life lets us down, but not with God. You see, in him, we have, an, uh, we have a hope that is an anchor for the soul. We have a hope that is steadfast and certain because it's rooted, as Peter writes in verse three, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and all that this means for us. He's defeated sin. He's defeated death. The, the greatest enemy has no mastery over us now. He's blazed a trail to heaven and flung wide its gates, making it possible for all who trust in him to follow on and take up residence in the room prepared for us. That's our, our hope, isn't it? Our certain hope for Dorothy. And actually, you know, we've lost a few people this year, last year, beg your pardon. And of course, it's really sad. And our grief and sense of loss are real. But because of this living hope, our sadness can be tempered with the knowledge that we have that in Christ and what he has achieved in his death, resurrection and ascension, our hope is in him and in eternity. And Peter sums all this up far better than I can by saying next that verse four, we have a certain inheritance that can never perish spoil or fade kept in heaven for you can never perish spoil or fade i think i'm on my fourth or fifth laptop now and that after two desktops i, I can't prove this but i think i'm on something like my 10th mobile phone now in the last 20 years or so uh, every time you know i upgrade i look for the best in the, in the hope that it will last but these things spoil and fade as the battery gives up or they perish because the memory gets filled or the software becomes tired there seems to be such a, a built-in obsolescence with so much today and this expectation that we need to upgrade over and over again when when our fourth child was born we needed a bigger car than the usual so we bought a toyota space cruiser eight seats two sunroofs the dog um uh, he was a labrador retriever ben at the time could sit under the bigger of the two sunroofs in in, in the back and his head would be out and his ears would be flapping in the wind as he went along obviously the, before the day before health and safety and all that sort of thing I just love that car we went everywhere in it over Europe uh, through this country so many memories 10 years in and 100,000 miles later it failed its MOT it had rusted underneath where you couldn't see and the cost of repairing that car was way beyond its value it perished what I'm trying to say is things and sometimes the things we put our hope in in this life perish spoil and fade but hear this the inheritance we have in Christ Christ who, who is the same yesterday today and forever that inheritance which is kept in heaven for us that can never perish spoil or fade it's eternal it's certain uh, all we've said so far you know being chosen before the foundation of the world having this living hope and a certain inheritance in heaven peter's bringing something really valuable here that, that is throughout all of these verses and, and and it's this it's fourthly an eternal perspective to life uh, this is something i think our day and age has lost sight of yeah. you know we live for the minute now don't we we eat drink and be merry for tomorrow we die is some wisdom out there life's too short to sort of wait and hang around and and dither and so on and of course there's some merit in in this seize the day don't let the grass grow under your feet but there's a danger in this of forgetting this that life is greater than the sum of our days let me just say that again life is greater than the sum of our days when we embraced christ we became immortal we, we, we locked into eternity it's an eternity in which we were chosen back back then by god and it's an eternity in which we have a promise beyond then in him 
You see, our life on earth is just a chapter in the book of eternal life. Peter hints at this back in verse one. He says we're strangers in the world. And that word strangers has this sense of, of travelers or, or refugees. We may live here, but it's temporary. We're just a passing through, as the old Negro, Negro spiritual says. Our citizenship is no longer in Europe. But listen, we're not even British. We're citizens of heaven. Our passports say we're subjects of the king in his kingdom. So do you grasp the significance of this? Whatever we experience now, joys or sorrows, pleasures or griefs, trials and temptations, you know, we can view all of our earthly experiences in the light of eternity. If it's good now, it'll be even better then. If it's tough now, it'll be even better then. Some critics, of course, of Christianity, you know, might say or do say, ah, that's all pie in the sky when you die. But in his next point here, Peter refers to actually what is stake on the plate while we wait. For he says, fifthly, in verse five, we have a divine protection in life. Because he says, those of us who through faith are shielded by God's power, until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. That word shielded is a, is a military word, meaning being escorted. Roman citizens going on hazardous journeys in the first century could benefit from a military escort, complete with, with shield and sword. The, the traveller would be protected, although it didn't guarantee there wouldn't be attacks, of course. Peter is saying, look, we're shielded, by God's power. He's saying that just as eternity before this life was in his hands, and just as eternity after this life is in his hands, so in this life we are in his hands. We're not exempt from attacks or hardships or trials or griefs, but the knowledge that he holds us through them and the knowledge that we have a home in heaven bring much comfort. Peter's only building, of course, to his next point, the sixth point here that we have a godly perspective on suffering verse six he says this in all of this you greatly rejoice we'll come back to rejoicing in a minute though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire may be proved genuine and result in praise glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Quite a, quite a sentence. Peter's laying a foundation here for life, which makes sense of suffering and struggle and helps us to cope with it. Here's a rock to stand on in the stormy seas of life. You see, if we know that we're firmly held by God, then we can see trials as a way of deepening our faith, of refining our faith. Precious metals are refined, aren't they, and purified. And how is that done? By, by, by stroking them, by, by cosseting them and saying encouraging things to them? No, of course not. They're put through fire so that the impurities rise to the top and are scooped away, thus refining the metal. Peter uses gold as an example of this. But even here, he says about gold that even in the end, even this will perish. But he says, but not your faith in the rock who is Christ. This will last. I probably told you this before, I know I have, about the farewell service at Bible College when I was leaving back in 1990. The preacher at that service was the then Archbishop of Canterbury, I know, George Carey. You sort of expect a big rousing up and at em sort of speech to these fledgling Baptist ministers off to pastor churches. But he chose to speak on how suffering strengthens and deepens your faith because it makes you depend on God more. He said that the quality of the boat is not proved in the dock or on a sunny and calm day, but the quality of a boat is proved in the storms. So it is in, in ministry, and so it is with our faith. 
But because of the dependability of the one we trust in, our faith will hold and our hold on him and him on us will grow stronger. There is a godly perspective on suffering, which can result in, seventhly, I'm nearly towards the end now, a great joy, even in these difficult times. I bet you can all think of inspiring Christians in, in your past, or perhaps you know them now, who bring inspiration because of the way they cope with suffering rather than for their exploits for God. You know, such folk often exude, don't they, a serenity of the soul, a, a deep joy which persists despite circumstances because their trust is completely in the Lord. So Peter can say, verses 8 and 9, even though you do not see him now, it's Christ, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Finally, in verses 10 to 12, Peter tells us we have the secret to life. These are quite convoluted verses, aren't they? Concerning this salvation, he says, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest of care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. And they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. That's a bit complicated. But uh, it's just a long way round of saying that all these things that we've been looking at in the previous verses, the gospel, who we are in Christ and what we have in Christ, these are things that the prophets pondered. These are things that preachers have proclaimed. These are things that angels long to look into. And now we have experienced them. We're chosen of the Lord, everyone. And we're chosen by him to receive new birth into a living hope and a certain inheritance and an eternal perspective on life with divine protection in this life and a godly perspective on suffering and to do so with great joy. All of this, the gospel, is the secret to life. So that's it. The gospel and the way it impacts on our lives. Here is the recipe for confident Christianity, even in, perhaps particularly in, difficult times. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for, for your word, which as ever, Lord, although written centuries ago, still shouts its relevance to us today. We thank you, Lord, for words which are a great encouragement and which inspire confidence in us, even in these difficult days and difficult times. Just pray, Lord, that the confidence that comes from knowing you, from embracing your gospel, would, I was going to say, seep into our hearts. Lord, flood our hearts, Lord, with these great truths that we might be confident in you. In Jesus' name. Amen.